ECDC On Air, the podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, my name is Nicholas and I'm your host for today's episode of ECDC On Air, which is the podcast for the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Today I have with me Gerion Ikink, who is ECDC's principal expert on public health foresight. Gerion, can you start off by explaining what is meant by foresight and why is it important? Sure. So foresight, in a nutshell, is a systematic, participatory and well-informed way of exploring, anticipating and even shaping the future. It's a combination of using evidence, expertise, interaction between these experts and creativity, bringing them together so you mitigate the blind spots and the biases they have. So it's a sort of an umbrella term for multiple forward-looking methods, and they all have different kinds of approaches. and also all kinds of different applications, but they're all structured and they all usually look at least 10 years ahead. Normally it is qualitative more than quantitative. Uh, We're using it in a functional way. So to detect threats or find ways of innovating uh, or shaping strategy. And I think what's quite important is to mention that it shouldn't be mixed up with forecasting because forecasting is really using data from the past to extrapolate to the future using some assumptions. But that basically the assumption is that the future is something like the past. And we know that actually that's not true. And also foresight is not prediction. It's really about exploring possible futures and their implications together with diverse expertise. But we're not claiming that we're predicting anything. Can you explain a little bit more concretely how is it being carried out? Because there's no data on the future, as the future hasn't happened yet, we are looking at change in foresight. So we're identifying change, what kind of change is already happening in the world and what's coming our way, and that you can do with, for example, horizon scanning. We're interpreting change, and that is more sense-making, so what kind of implications of these change we're expecting. Imagining what these changes will do in the future, and one way of doing this is, for example, to develop scenarios, which we have done. And finally, acting on change. So it's very important in strategic foresight that it's the start of an intervention. It's not just something you do out of academic interest or something. You can do that, but we're using it in a way that has to be useful for the organization. So no crystal balls are involved. It's really about collective intelligence. It's a lot of desk research, a lot of interaction with, uh, with experts in different formats. So really bringing together different diverse ideas and perspectives about the future so you can help plan and act in the present. Okay. Why should public health experts care about foresight? I think foresight has been called a competence for the 21st century, and that's because we're increasingly living in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, but we still have to make smart decisions. And although the future is unknowable, doesn't mean we have to blindly stumble into it. For public health experts, the main aim for us is to make European public health systems more resilient and better prepared to future health threats and other developments that are relevant. And we cannot be in constant crisis mode. We've learned a lot of lessons during the COVID-19 crisis, and it was a crisis not necessarily because of issues in virology or epidemiology, but maybe what made it difficult for so many public health bodies is that it was geopolitics, was uh, the high media attention, polarization, fatigue in society, budget cuts, staff shortages, all those kinds of things. So not necessarily directly related with the work of public health experts. So the lesson I think we learned is that we have to look wider outside of our area of expertise and also further ahead to anticipate these changing realities, manage their uncertainties and prepare for future threats. Foresight can help with all of this. And that's why also for ECDC, it's a strategic priority. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Can you tell us a little bit more the reasons why ECDC has invested in this? Yeah, so listeners familiar to this podcast, they know that ECDC is all about protecting citizens against infectious diseases since its foundation. And we also want to do that in 20 years. And like I said, we cannot assume that the future is anything like the past. And indeed, we are seeing accelerating changes. We are seeing increasingly interconnected challenges coming our way. So this is something we should address. And we want to make public health systems more prepared and resilient to future health threats. And this is the main reason why we're doing it. 
So we have been, and I think many public health bodies have been in constant crisis mode for the last years. And although much of that we cannot influence, there are some things we are not powerless. So we can prepare, we can adapt and actually prevent that we go into crisis mode. Many of these things do have, though, a long uh, lead time. Think, for example, about uh, data infrastructures or reskilling of workforce, new collaborative networks we have to set up. That means that we have to work now on them and make the strategic decision now so that we are ready in the future and really avoid blind spots along the way. Foresight is a tool, it's not a silver bullet, but it really helps in this. Maybe you can give a bit more of an overview of what the Foresight program at ECDC entails. What lies ahead now? What is the structure? First, it's important to say that the realities keep changing, and that means that also the future possibilities keep changing. And that's why foresight should not be a one-off, it shouldn't be one single study and then we're done, but it should be a continuous process. So we're doing capacity building in strategic foresight, future thinking, system thinking, uh, first internal, and then eventually we want to go out with that as well to our partners. And also we're exploring horizon scanning, processes, which are more systematic ways of looking at weak signals of change that are coming your way and then proactively preparing for those. But as a starting point and a foundation, uh, sort of a common language we want to develop first around futures, we're currently doing a a big ongoing project around uh, threat scenarios, six future threat scenarios that take into account a complex network development of different drivers of change going one way or another. And then we make our way back to the present to see, okay, if these are the potential future realities, how do we have to prepare for that coming from the present? Can you just explain a little bit what is a driver for change and how have they been identified? We started this process by first looking at important global trends that we already see happening in the world, which are called megatrends. We've used the ones from the, that the European Commission's uh, Joint Research Center has uh, developed previously. So there are 14 different ones and they cover things like uh, climate or hyperconnectivity, demographic imbalances, increased resource scarcity, technological acceleration, those kinds of things, for example. From there, we've looked at underlying driving forces of changes that are most relevant to public health and in particular infectious diseases. So we've identified 36, and then we've, at some point, with experts, reduced them to a top 10 that are actually quite diverse. So they cover grounds, for example, like inequalities in access to healthcare, aging populations, travel, migration, urbanization, climate change, natural resource pressures, geopolitical issues, and ways of how we communicate, uh, handle data, for example, artificial intelligence. And then there's only one that really is directly related with infectious diseases, and that's antimicrobial resistance. Which trends would have the most consequences for public health, do you think? It's a difficult question that also has a little bit to do with the timeline you're considering. At the moment, we're seeing uh, inequalities in access to healthcare and misinformation, geopolitical issues and how we share data. We already see issues with this. Those have consequences for public health. And in the longer term, I'd say it's climate change, for example, antimicrobial resistance and AI tools of use of AI uh, in one way or another. But how we are looking at it it, towards 2040, we, we have looked at drivers of change. And for each of them, we've looked at what is the most plausible pathway that we'll take to 2040 and what are alternative, also plausible pathways that we should take into account. Uh, and then really consider what are the impact of that on our operations and mission. Although that's already useful, what we're not taking into account for all of these separate drivers is that they interact with each other. So all these drivers, they don't develop in a vacuum. They influence each other, and we have to take that complexity into account. So talking about which trends would have the most consequences, we have to look at them as a network, and this is why we have developed scenarios. We have six different scenarios. They cover a lot of ground, quite broad, also quite far outside of what you would normally consider part of public health. We have scenarios, for example, where uh, collaboration and solidarity and sharing of resources is very well done. And we have, on the other side, we also have scenarios that are describing more polarized, fragmented societies, for example. One that goes more into nature-based solutions, uh, where that is very much the focus. Another one that is more on uh, heavily urbanized and digitalized society, for example. Also, 
where governance lies. So who is in power? Is it uh, nation states? Are there cities that are coming up? Or is it fragmented, isolated communities? I mean, all these different developments will have an impact on our future work. So we're using these scenarios as a tool to make uncertainties and complexities more manageable. When you've identified these scenarios, do you kind of rank them in an order of uh, how likely they are to occur? Or are they all equally likely, would you say? Foresight focuses on uncertainties, and that's why probabilities or thinking about probabilities is a bit of a trap there. More likely developments that have high impact are probably already on your radar. And actually, what we're trying to achieve with foresight is that we're looking to reduce blind spots that we may potentially have, so tunnel vision. So focusing on probabilities, it causes a bit of tunnel vision. So that's why we're trying to keep an open mind, because what you for example, may consider very unlikely or even unthinkable, I would could consider plausible, for example. If we think back, let's say, uh, 15 years ago, a volcano erupting, blocking all kinds of air traffic in the Northern Hemisphere, or a debilitating uh, global pandemic, or war in Europe, I think for a lot of people would be unthinkable. And yet, here we are. So it is important that we keep an open mind, but at the same time, it also doesn't mean that anything goes. So we are following structured methods, evidence, and collective intelligence of multiple experts to form these scenarios and think about the probabilities, but not in a way that we're excluding certain directions or another. And you've chosen 2040 where you set the scenarios. Uh, is there any specific reason for choosing that year? Normally with Foresight, you want to go at least 10 years in the future. And that's because if you go too close to the present date, then people keep thinking about the current realities. So you really want to take it far enough in the future that people have to break free of the current ways of thinking, but not too far in the future that it becomes really all over the place. 2040 seemed like a nice date because it's more or less 15 years in the future. But also, if we're thinking about when ECDC was founded, we're pretty much halfway there. So it is actually nice to look back what has happened in the last 15 years and then to use that sort of mindset to think about what could happen in the next 15. I'd like to understand a bit more at what stage we are now. Uh, are we just in the very starting phases and still trying to identify the different scenarios and maybe sharpen our view on them or are we already at a stage where we can start to make adjustments for what might happen? A bit of both. So we have analyzed the drivers of change that are relevant for us. We, From that, we've looked at the interactions they have with each other. And from there, we have developed these future scenarios for 2040. And we're now actually working on the biggest chunk of the work, which is making that really relevant and tangible. So backcasting from that future scenario. So we're looking at a particular future, considering what kind of future attributes a effective EZDC should have in a future like that, and then working our way back to the present to see what kind of steps and actions we have to take to be an effective organization there. So we're in that stage, and that takes a lot of time. We have developed, in the meantime, almost 100 different policy and strategy options from that backcasting exercise. We are currently in the process of shortlisting them in a survey with both internal and external experts, also our governance bodies. And we're now sort of streamlining these in interviews with internal and external experts. So we're getting there, but this project is still not finished, but we will expect to publish something about this uh, this year. But of course, like I also said, foresight should be continuous. So. It doesn't mean that when we finish this and the report is there that that's done. It is an ongoing process. And part of that is really to help integrate foresight into our daily work. You know, this is a starting point of doing that in ECDC. And we should really continue building the capacity to do foresight methods, both ad hoc and more systematic in ECDC in the future on an ongoing basis. And from um, all the discussions that you've been following and the people that you've been consulting, would you say that the future is looking bright in terms of public health? Uh, are there more challenges or are there more opportunities? I think every time we go into a foresight workshop, people come out of them slightly depressed. But it also has to do with a bit of a bias that we put into this project from the start because we're looking at threat scenarios. So we're automatically looking at the more daunting things. And that mainly has to do is that we try to use this to be better prepared. 
But at the same time, none of these scenarios that we've developed are completely negative or completely positive. So we've really developed them in a way that none of them are really preferred and none of them really uh, dispreferred. In each of the scenarios, you can find opportunities that we should also exploit, but also threats that we should prepare for. It's a bit of both, but I'd say because of the reason we're looking at threats, it leans a bit to the negative side. Are there any particular examples you'd like to give, like concrete examples of challenges and threats and opportunities? Sure. So, for example, if we're looking at artificial intelligence, there are many potential benefits there. So we can use it to improve our collection and analysis of data, for example. But this has to be done ethically and carefully. Artificial intelligence can also be abused by players outside of ECDC, for example, to create more disinformation. And that's already something that is very difficult in the public health sphere. If we're thinking about other good developments or positive developments from the scenarios, for example, one focuses more on uh, greening of cities and rewilding of landscapes. And although that's very positive and we should do that to mitigate climate change, what also came out of this process is that if it's done poorly, it is actually a public health threat. Because if you bring nature close to where people live, you also bring mosquitoes, for example, you bring pests, you bring potentially infected wildlife. This was really an eye opener for a lot of people that you have positive developments, but they can have a negative public health effect. And although that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the positive development, it means that we have to prepare for the negative effects. Can you tell me a little bit more about what your own work entails? What's your day-to-day -day routine? First of all, I think it's very important to mention that foresight is never a one-person job. So the input of the foresight, that's something that we're doing with a lot of different people within ECDC and also outside. Internally, for some parts, we're engaging mainly with the disease experts, for example, but in many parts, we're actually using expertise from across the organization. So also people in human resources, learning and development, missions, for example, communication, because all these different perspectives, they're very important. And because we're trying to avoid blind spots, we have to include as much perspectives as possible. For the external experts, we're also working with a lot of experts that we normally, as an organization, don't really work with. Because, for example, experts in artificial intelligence or climate change, it's not types of expertise we normally engage with. We normally engage with other public health experts. I think this is the beauty of Foresight, that we're trying to bring together these kinds of people that are very diverse. And we're already building networks of experts that are useful to rely on in future crises. I also have a task force in ECDC that sort of steers the direction of the Foresight program to make sure that it fulfills the needs of the organization in every different unit that we have. And other than that, I think my job is more of a methodologist and a program manager. So I try to make sure that the project is on track, that uh, I bring people together, challenge their mindsets, help them think, and uh, also do some desk research on the sides. Are there a lot of public health organizations looking into the future like this, or is ECDC quite unique in this respect? Foresight in public health, uh, and especially in the area of infectious diseases, is quite new. And in many ways, ECDC is leading the way here. Several member states are taking steps in the area, some quite advanced steps already, and also WHO, for example, is, is looking into foresight. So major future changes and their drivers of change that we face are actually very similar to those of these partners. That means that we should, in the future, not take a very fragmented approach that everything, everybody does their own thing, but really should link up more, especially also with other players in the One Health field. I see there's a way where we can bring this together. But at the moment, I'd say we're at the starting phase for Foresight in public health and that ECDC is in one of the you know, more advanced ones. Okay, thanks, Gerion. I think these were all the questions that I had for you today. Thanks for coming to ECDC On Air. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of ECDC On Air. For more information about ECDC and its work, please visit us on the web at ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media.